Hi, this is Derek Jordan. Thank you for joining us today on the World Fusion Show, where we bring you the leading innovators of world fusion music. Um, today we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of doing an interview and performing with one of our fabulous guests, I'm going to, I'd like to share with you my own composition process and talk about some of my world fusion compositions. So let's talk a little bit about the term world fusion music, which I don't really like. Um, it's too vague. It's just not specific enough. And basically what it refers to is any music that's not American or European. Um, pop music, country, blues, classical are all music that is not world music, right? But uh, that's not such a great thing. It's better if we were more specific and said, oh, you know, let's talk about uh, Brazilian music or African music or, or flamenco music or whatever. That would be a better way to talk about world music and specifically talk about the styles that are being brought together. So what we're doing with World Fusion is we're bringing different styles from different cultures together and blending them and trying to create new hybrid styles using those specific rhythms, scales, elements that are unique to those cultures. So the process that I use for my composition is what I call deep listening. I find good recordings of the authentic music from these cultures, and then I listen and listen and listen. Some people say that the best way to learn a language is through immersion, living in the culture. And this is exactly what I try to do before I start writing. I don't use traditional melodies when I write my pieces. I try to listen a lot and then get inspired to write my own melodies and then work with those melodies. But I do listen a lot to the specific rhythms and scales, tonalities, feel and groove of these cultures to try and emulate that. Um, one of the things that is interesting, I find, is the scales that people use. Now, in the U.S. and in Europe, we use, commonly use, a seven-note scale. It's major or minor, okay? So you can think of it as vanilla or chocolate, right? You get vanilla, major scale, sounds kind of happy, positive, or the minor scale, which is maybe a little sad, a little moody, but there's seven notes. And what makes the difference between these two scales is the third, the third note of the scale. Now, in the major scale, it's two whole steps from the tonic. In the minor scale, it's a whole step and a half step from the tonic. So it's a flatted third. And believe it or not, that difference is a huge thing in our perception. We really feel the music differently in, in what it uses. Now, a lot of world music cultures don't use seven note scales. Some of them use five note scales, which we call pentatonic scales. For instance, in Africa, there's a scale called the suspended pentatonic, which is a five note scale and has no third. So it sounds neither major or minor, giving it somewhat ambiguous kind of a feeling to it. Um, I love this scale. I use it a lot in my music. And there are other scales, such as the Kumoi scale from Japan, which also doesn't have a third in it. Um, it it's, turns out that what you leave out, the notes you leave out of the scale, make it quite interesting and create some really new flavors in the music. So I was offered to do a commission by the Wyndham Orchestra. And I wrote a piece called Wyndham Loops for full orchestra and my World Fusion Power Trio Impulse Ensemble with Tony Vaca on balafone, Jim Matis on electric Greek lute, and myself on electric violin. Um, this piece um, takes us basically on a journey around the world through many different styles. Um, and what I'd like to share with you now is a TEDx talk that I did 
in Brattleboro with Hugh Keelan. Hugh is the conductor of the Wyndham Orchestra. And in this TED Talk, we um, talk about looping. Hugh starts the talk with a, uh, talk a little bit about Beethoven because Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was also in the program. He describes how Beethoven used looping in his own composition. And then I give an introduction and do a solo looping demonstration on my electric violin. Um, and uh, so I'm playing a piece there called Tubob, which is a piece I wrote in Senegal. Um, interestingly enough, when I wrote the piece, um, I was very inspired on that trip. And I would, late at night, I would tuck myself in, uh, tuck the mosquito netting in around my bed, try to go to sleep, but I'd wake up with music. I'd untuck the mosquito netting, get my notebook, start writing down my music that was coming to me. Um, Two Bob was one of those pieces that came. So let's watch this TEDx talk. For the first time ever, the world will hear Derek's piece, but for the 19 millionth time, people will hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. So what is the thread between these two things? Uh, D Derek will explain uh, his concept of looping, but there's a very handy connection between what Beethoven what, uh, wrote and, and what Derek wrote. Uh, so in, in music, there's nothing new, that there's, everything is borrowed, everything's from somewhere else. And I mean no disrespect to Derek nor to Ludwig when, when I say so. Um, but there's a limited number of notes. Uh, in general, the meters and ideas that people use have been used countless times already by any point in music history. Extending that idea is the idea of looping, which is very self-referential, referring back to itself, reinvestigating itself, repeating itself type of idea. And that ties in perfectly to one of Beethoven's greatest innovations. But Beethoven had an obsessive quality amongst many other qualities. But one, one, of his, one of the extraordinary things about Beethoven was taking a simple form that you could describe as an A, B, A. So in old times, a minuet, a trio, a return, an exact return of the minuet. And sometimes there are sort of A, B, A structures within each of those sections. He decided, no, 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 no. We're going to do A, B, A, B. Uh, a, B, A, and, and another B, A. So, so just another spin through of, of, of that cycling. So that was a huge innovation for, for Beethoven. The, the, the other great thing about Beethoven and what he did was he permitted himself to use obsessive rhythms. So in the Ninth Symphony, there's some incredibly famous ones. If, if anybody remembers the, the demonic skirts of the Ninth Symphony, dump it, bump it, bump this sort of galloping rhythm that literally is there the whole time, every single measure of the A section in his doubly repeating A, B, A, B, A form. Another great example is the opening of the Fifth Symphony, da, 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 dum, which then, you know, it's a big, 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 big chunky seed that becomes the, the, the just just germinates, you know, again, da, 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 just a kind of layering of that idea on top of another. So that was Beethoven's view of looping. Thank you. Um, you never know where a good idea is going to come from. And uh, have you ever noticed that when um, ideas don't always come at convenient times? <laughs> they don't, right? No. But um, I was walking into the Brattleboro Club one day and a friend who is a member of the Wyndham Orchestra said, oh, you know, I really, um, you should write a piece for the Wyndham Orchestra and uh, you should use the orchestra as a looper. And I thought, what a great idea, <laughs> what a cool idea. Now, a looper, this is a looper right here, um, a little pedal, right? And what it does is it takes phrases that I play on the violin and repeats them. So I use it when I perform solo sometimes just to create a whole huge complex sound uh, with, you know, a lot of different parts. It's like instant composition. It's a way to improvise and create more out of just one person. So, um, so I thought that was great. And then Hugh asked me to write this piece and... You know, suddenly we had an idea, and he, then he said, oh, well, put Impulse Ensemble in it, too. And I'm like, whoa, Impulse Ensemble, that's great. So um, it's a trio that I have that um, with Tony Vaca on balafon and percussion, Jim Matus on electric Greek lute, and myself on violin. And we work with a lot of improvisation. So our styles are kind of African, Middle Eastern, funk. Oh, jazz, a bunch of different things. So now we have to. Now I had to bring that element into the 
piece as well. This is my first piece for um, for a full orchestra. So it was really, the whole thing was really large. Now I see I'm running out of time and I want to play the violin for you. So I'm going to shut up and play. <laughs> So I had the great good fortune to grow up when I did in the 60s and to be exposed to so much fantastic music. Um, I um, also was very lucky in that I went to Bennington College where I got to work with some great composers. Uh, Henry Brandt was one of them. I also got to work with a master drummer when I was there who became my mentor. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful percussionist named Milford Graves. And Milford really opened me up to the world of, world, to, to, the, to world music, to African, Brazilian, um, Asian, all kinds of Indian, all kinds of wonderful music. Um, he is known primarily as a, a trap drummer, a drum set player, but also plays other, all percussion. And from him, I mostly learned, uh, focused on congas and started playing congas a lot. Um, and really focusing more on rhythm in general and really which helped everything else that I was playing. Um, I really started off my um, musical journey as a singer songwriter. So before Bennington, I was writing songs, pop songs mostly. I was inspired by the Beatles, of course, growing up in the 60s. Jimi Hendrix was a huge influence. James Taylor and Stevie Wonder. Those are basically my four big, big influences. And I played guitar, keyboards, accompanying my songs, and also played violin and cello. So the next thing I wanted to do was go to a clip of the piece, Wyndham Loops, and it's gonna be excerpts from the piece. Now, this, this piece sort of takes the listener through a musical journey through many different styles. Indian, West African, Middle Eastern, Balinese, funk, a lot of different things. Um, it also contains solos from myself and the two other members of Impulse Ensemble in between the different movements, which they're improvised solos and they create a looser uh, kind of a presentation than it would be if we were just 
all reading music. So um, Wyndham Loops um, is a lot of fun. It uses a lot of these different kinds of rhythms, different kinds of unusual scales. Um, it uses uh, um, an, a variation on uh, the monkey chant, a very famous Balinese uh, piece that, that's quite well known and interesting, where the I asked the orchestra members to chant and do things. Um, I also play some electric violin with wah-wah to get into some funk at the end. And you'll hear Tony playing some gongs and Jim doing a beautiful solo on his lautar, the electric Greek lute. Wyndham Loops. We had huge success with Wyndham Loops. It was a joy for the orchestra to play with Impulse Ensemble. Impulse Ensemble clearly were kind of wowed by the experience. It combines the old world, the new world, symphonic techniques, the wonderful things that Impulse Ensemble do, extended techniques for the, for the symphonic players. And it's just great to see some of the players standing up from time to time and, and clapping, really creating a rhythm for, for the orchestra. Sibilant sounds, shouting, just delicious and unexpected things that, that the orchestra is, is required to do. On top of that, you've got three-part trombone harmony and wonderful, wonderful rhythms, wonderful, wonderful jazz and rock rhythms hitting around the room. World music, classical music, these, these things they, they, it's, it's not quite as simple as crossover. They're, they're much more sort of fuzzy boundaries than simply two things existing side by side and occasionally shaking hands. Oh, they really integrate. And it's just a very exciting piece for everybody to be part of, performers and audience alike.
attracted to many different kinds of music, many different kinds of music from all over the world. One of them is Middle Eastern music. And um, I wrote a piece called Sandcastles, which is also one of the movements I adapted for Wyndham Loops. But what it does is it has a very long, very long melody. Um, uh, and in this piece, which we're going to hear, um, my good friends Eric Lawrence plays flute and Billy White plays oud. I am playing electric violin and frame drum and tablas, but ra I'm not playing a real tabla. What I'm playing is my hand sonic, which is a MIDI controller sampler, and it contains samples of the tabla. Tabla is an Indian instrument percussion instrument of two witches, two drums, a high drum and a low drum. And I wanted to just quickly demonstrate the, my hand sonic and the tabla, which sounds, I think, very much like the real instrument. So, um, so you get the idea. That's the hand sonic and the tabla sound. Now, when you hear this next piece, Sandcastles, um, you'll get to hear the tabla in there and see what you think. See how real it sounds to you.
So that is Sandcastles, which has a Middle Eastern influence, but also uses the tabla, which is not a Middle Eastern instrument, it's an Indian instrument. So there you have some fusion of different styles together. So um, thank you for coming today, watching the show. This is Derek Jordan, your host on the World Fusion Show. Thanks for joining us and being part of the music today. Remember, think globally, listen locally, and support independent music.